Hello, this is Andy here, and in between uh, visiting family and eating and drinking far too much, I spent the 2017 Christmas break uh, taking a pop at the Sands Holiday Hack. For the uninitiated, this is a festive themed capture the flag hacking challenge uh, created for the Sands Institute by the folks at Counter Hack Challenges. The prize is up for grabs for the best write-up, so this series of videos forms my submission, as well as attempting to act as a, a bit of a how-to guide for anyone who got a bit stuck, or perhaps didn't get around to finishing all of the challenges in time. So, full disclosure, uh, whilst my job is in cybersecurity and I have dabbled uh, in some of the offensive parts previously, I'm by no means a professional red teamer. Uh, this challenge was certainly a learning experience for me, and there may be a few areas which I've uh, missed along the way, so uh, please post in the video comments any corrections or clarifications. Each year there's a festive background story to the holiday hack. Uh, this year, the North Pole is under a siege from huge snowballs rolling down the mountains, uh, destroying Santa's toy-making infrastructure and threatening to ruin Christmas for years. The main objective of the challenge is to find out who's responsible for the giant snowballs and to stop them. Additionally, an interdimensional tornado has ripped apart a priceless history book and scattered its pages. So we're also challenged with finding each of the pages to rebuild the book. In practice, there's a few different components to the challenge. Uh, first off, there's the nine main challenge questions. Uh, these form the bulk of the hacking activities, and it's the write-up of these which forms the submission for the competition. Then there's the North Pole and Beyond game. Uh, this consists of some puzzles involving redirecting rolling snowballs to complete specific objectives and terminal challenges which involve helping some of Santa's elves with some Linux command line problems. Upon completion of each terminal challenge, the elves reward you with an extra tool to help complete the rolling snowball puzzles, as well as some hints for each part of the main hacking challenge. I decided to gently ease myself in by focusing on some of the smaller terminal challenges first. Uh, it turns out this was a pretty good move as the hints and clues provided uh, by successfully completing these uh, was uh, really quite invaluable. Uh, so let's start with the troublesome process challenge uh, from the Cliffs of Swin Sanity level. Uh, here we find one of the elves, Sparkle Redberry, uh, is having trouble with a process which just won't seem to die. Um, normally the kill command will end a process, but in this case it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, the kill command works by sending a signal to the process in question. Uh, by default this is the SIG term, or terminate signal, uh, but it's entirely up to the target process what to do when it receives the SIG term signal. This kind of makes sense. Uh, if the process is being told to terminate, it might have some housekeeping task to finish before exiting, so that it doesn't leave its application data in an inconsistent or corrupt state. Uh, but this, is, this doesn't work if the process has found its way into a bad state, uh, such as stuck waiting for some sort of input event to take place. Uh, in which case, we can try sending the sig kill signal uh, by adding the dash nine argument to the, the kill command. Sig kill is never interpreted by the target process. Uh, instead, uh, this signal is caught by the init process, uh, which is responsible for spawning all other processes, and um, which will in turn terminate the target process. Uh, note also that in this challenge, even SIG kill is insufficient to terminate this troublesome process. Uh, again, you know, this could be due to it waiting on some sort of disk or network input-output event, uh, which has never arrived. Uh, usually, if uh, SIG kill doesn't work, uh, a reboot is, is required. Uh, but clearly, there must be a different solution for this challenge. Uh, and so I wondered if the top system monitoring program would have any better luck. And sure enough, it did. Um, interestingly, also top uh, sent the uh, signal 15 or sig term uh, by default. Um, so it left me wondering, well, why was the, the signal from top working, uh, but those from kill not? And so after a little further investigation, I realized that kill was not returning any of the usual expected output when compared to uh, one of my other Linux boxes. Um, so it looks uh, as if the kill command itself has been modified or tampered with uh, to stop it from functioning properly on this box. But anyway, uh, the process is now killed and Sparkle Redberry has rewarded me with some hints for the main challenge. 
Next up was the command hijacking challenge from the Winter Wonder landing level. Uh, here we find Bushy Evergreen, uh, who needs to start a program uh, but can't find where it's stored. Um, the obvious answer here is to use the find command to scour the file system for files matching certain criteria, and in this case uh, those matching the name of Elf Talk D. Uh, but the find program seems to be corrupted. I thought about what other common commands might be used to the same effect. I remember using the locate command in the past, um, but it was not installed on this particular system. Uh, then I remember the du command, which is usually used to show how much disk space is used by files and folders. Uh, it works by traversing the file system and adding up the file sizes in each folder. The dash a option also shows file sizes too, and so combined with grep, allow me to find the elf talk d program and get it running again. So I got the hints from Bushy Evergreen and went on my way, uh, but it was only later that the name of this challenge really clicked in my mind, and I realised my solution probably wasn't the one uh, that the folks at uh, Sands and Counterhack were expecting. Uh, so just to recap, the name here was Command Hijacking. On both Windows and Linux command line systems, um, there's a environment variable called $path uh, that lists the locations where common commands are found. Uh, this makes it possible to simply type the name of the program you want to run without spe specifying the whole path to it. So in the case of du and grep above, um, I could just reference the name of the programs directly instead of explicitly defining where they should be found. The system checks each of the folders specified in the path environment variable, and if it finds a program with the same name, will run it. Note, however, that it checks these folders in order. Therefore, in our case, user local sbin is checked first, followed by user local bin, then user sbin, user bin, sbin, bin, and finally user games. Command hijacking refers to the practice of placing a malicious program with the same name as a common command into a folder which is earlier in the path search order than the genuine command. And that's exactly what's happened on Bushy Evergreen's system. If we run find without specifying the path, we're actually running the copy that's found in user local bin. Whereas in fact, the genuine copy of find uh, is found in user bin. And sure enough, if we explicitly run the version that is uh, stored within user bin, we find that it works exactly as expected. So I may not have solved this in the intended way, but hey, a win is a win nonetheless. Now let's take a look at the candy cane stripper challenge found in the cryokinetic magic level. Holly Evergreen is having difficulty in running a program. The obvious thing that jumps out here is that the program file does not have the execute permission bit set, which means any attempt to run it will be denied. This is part of the Unix security model, and it's a good way of making it a little more difficult for malicious code to run on a system. The chmod command is the usual route to change the permission bit to allow it to run, but as this file is owned by root, and we, as the elf user, do not have permission to modify the file, would be unable to do so. Interestingly, the chmod command doesn't throw any error if we attempt to do this anyway, nor does it provide any output. As seems common with some of these terminal challenges, it appears as if the chmod command has been modified to make it non-functional. Now, I was aware that non-executable scripts can be run explicitly by running the script interpreter, which is an executable, and feeding the script as an input. That won't work in this case, as Candy Cane Stripper is a binary executable, not a script. But surely there must be a similar method I can use for binaries. And with a quick bit of googling, I see that this is indeed the case. Uh, we can use the LD shared library uh, to launch a program. And voila, the Candy Cane Stripper is back up and running, and I'm rewarded with some more hints for the main challenge. Next, we have the Train Startup Challenge in the there's no place like home level. Here we encounter Pepper Minsticks, who, like Holly, is having difficulties in getting the program running. This time the file is marked as executable, but attempting to run it gives an error about the format of the binary file. We can check the details of the file by using the file command. This looks for key information in a file to, to, to determine its true format, irrespective of any file extension. Here we see it is indeed an elf executable binary, but it's designed for an ARM processor. 
the instructions for an ARM processor are completely different for an x86 processor. So the only way to run the train startup code is via an emulator, which, as the name suggests, provides a virtual environment to emulate a different CPU. The QMU system is installed on this machine, and so it's quite simple to use this to launch the process. With Pepper Minsticks back up and running, we can turn to the next terminal, the weblog challenge found in the Bumble's bounce level. Minty Candy Cane is asking for help to examine some weblogs. This challenge is relatively trivial to understand. We're provided with a web server log file, and we just need to identify which web browser is the least popular. The format of the file is pretty standard for weblogs, one line per request, with the client software clearly identifiable. Looking at the last few lines of the log file, uh, we see Firefox and Slack mentioned here. So no particular technical knowledge is required to complete this challenge, just an understanding of some of the common command line tools that can be used for data manipulation and how they can be plumbed together. I've already demonstrated one of them here, the, the tail command, uh, which prints the last few lines of a file. The first task is to isolate the client software from the rest of the information on each line of the log file. We can use the awk command to do this. By default, it will split each line up into its constituent parts, using a space as a delimiter, and allows us to specify which one we'd like to print. In this case, the client software is the 12th item on each line. I've tacked this onto the end of the previous tail command using a pipe symbol, so that we're only working with the last few lines of the file whilst we're developing the right combination of data manipulations. The pipe simply takes the output from the left command and provides it as the input for the right command. Next, we need to count how many occurrences we have of each client. The unique command will usually take an input list and remove any duplicates, but with the dash C or count option, it'll also display how many occurrences there were of each unique value. Note, however, that we're still getting some duplicates, and the help text of the unique command explains why. Unique does not detect repeated lines unless they are adjacent. It also helpfully suggests that we may want to sort the input files first or use sort-u without unique. Let's go ahead and add a sort in between the awk and the unique. This looks like it's operating correctly, so we can examine the whole log file by replacing tail with cat, which lists all of the contents of a file, not just the last few lines. The output is a bit messy, and there's still some duplicates due to different versions of client software, but for this challenge, this is good enough. There's a handful of occurrences where just one client is detected, Dillo, Curl and Mascan, but the latter two have a couple of duplicates. With a bit more refinement, a better set of processing commands can be found which provide a cleaner output, but now the elves argument has been settled, we can move on to the next challenge. Next we have the Christmas Songs Data Analysis Challenge from the I don't think we're in Kansas anymore level. Like the previous challenge, this one is about manipulating large data sets to extract key information. In this case, it's SQL. The .db extension is commonly used for SQLite databases, and sure enough, the SQLite program is installed and opens this file. Before working with the data, it's essential to understand the schema, or how the data is arranged. In SQLite, the .tables command lists all of the tables in the database, and .schema describes the fields in each table. This database has two tables, one is a list of songs, and the other is a list of likes. It appears that a song is liked if the like field is set to 1. We can use SQL to group all of the likes for each song together using the group by parameter, and the total number of likes is calculated by summing up all of the like fields. The order by parameter is used to sort each of these groups by the total sum of likes of each group, and then limit is used to return only the top five. From this output, we can see that song ID 392 is the most popular, with a total of 8,996 likes. Looking this up in the songs table, we see it's Stairway to Heaven. With the correct answer submitted, we can move on to the penultimate terminal challenge, the Shadow File Restoration Challenge in the Oh Wait, Maybe We Are level. Here we need to help fix Shiny Upper Tree's shadow file by replacing it with the shadow.back copy. In order to achieve the copy, we need two things. First, to be able to read the source file, and second, to be able to write to the destination file. Comparing the permissions on these files via the ls command 
against the current user access via the ID command, we see no problem with the first requirement. The shadow.back file is world readable. But the destination file can only be written by either the root user or by a member of the shadow group, neither of which hold true for the current user. This challenge kindly gives an extra hint, suggesting looking at what commands can be run with sudo. sudo-l lists the sudo capabilities for the current user, which states that the find command can be run in the context of user elf group shadow without having to specify any additional password. So this gives us an opportunity to run the find command with shadow group permissions, which are required for overwriting the shadow file. So now we just need to find a way to either get find to do the copy itself or to launch another process to do so. After some careful examination of the manual page for find, I spotted the dash exec option, which will run a command each time find locates a matching file or folder. Tying this all together gives the desired result. The shadow file is restored and Shani provides a reward of a few more clues for the main challenge. The final terminal challenge is, is it 42? Found in the last level, we're off to see that. Here, OneOrs OpenSlay has written an app which generates a random number. OneOrs' challenge is to make the app return 42. My first instinct here would be to run the app in a debugger and fiddle with its operation that way. However, GDB is not installed on this system and one of us is kind enough to hint that the solution to this challenge would require writing some code. A snippet of the code's operation is also provided. The internal getRand function is called to generate the random number, which itself leverages the standard external shared rand function. If this external call can be intercepted and tampered with, we can specify a return value which, which results in the number 42 always being generated. A quick browse of the SANS pen testing blog turns up a recent explanation of how to do exactly that, and it was considerably more simple than I expected. Here's the code I used to replace the RAND call, which simply returns a value of 42. It's compiled, and forcibly loaded to override the usual shared library call for RAND, and the challenge is complete. And again, we're rewarded with some hints for the main challenge. So with all the terminal challenges now complete and a stocking full of helpful hints, it's time to attempt the main challenge questions. <laughs>